I should explain that uh, I'm Ray McGovern Sr. Uh, my son uh, couldn't come tonight. I say that because I look a little different from the PR a little photo that was uh, advertised here. I say that in jest, of course. Uh, people do ask me why I look so disheveled or unkempt. And uh, that gives me a, a, an excuse to explain that I'm a friend of Julian Assange. And when I saw him unceremoniously carried out of the embassy there a year and a half ago, no, two and a half years, two and a half years ago, uh, I decided that the, I needed some way to identify myself with his suffering and his disheveled appearance. So this is a, a mark of solidarity with Julian. It's also a reminder. I don't forget about Julian, <laughs> neither does my wife. Uh, I can't pass a mirror or a, or a window without thinking of Julian. And it's very easy to forget your best friends, especially when there's a media a blockage on this kind of thing. So that's the reason for my untidy experience. I hope you will excuse me. Uh, today, we had some bad news. Uh, Julian was told, or his lawyers were told, that the, the next higher court uh, in, in London has allowed the US to appeal the part of the decision as to not to extradite him, the part that relied on Julian's health, and the prospect that he would perish under the torturous conditions of US prisons, quite an indictment of US uh, penology, right? The penal system. Uh, now, uh, now they can pursue on all counts. The bottom line here, in my view, is they're trying to keep uh, Julian as an example to anybody else who might fear, might feel that they can uh, expose US war crimes. That much is clear. Um, and he's been mean, being made an example so that, uh, you know, they'll keep him going from court to court. They'll keep him going from place to place until, uh, God forbid, he perishes before he ever gets free again. So um, my appeal to you all is to follow Julian's example, to get the, the truth out to the degree you can, and expose whatever you can in terms of the indignities that occur in this country or elsewhere. Now, I want to put a human face on, uh, on Julian uh, because after all, he is a human being. A terrible thing is happening to him. And so may I have the first slide, please? Now, not many of you will have seen this slide uh, because <laughs> I haven't seen it in any US media or even Western media. Here's Julian with his, uh, with his son, Gabriel, um, that uh, he and Stella Morris uh, uh, um, created uh, in, in the embassy of Ecuador. This is a couple of years ago. Uh, let me have the next slide. Now, there's... Uh, there's Gabriel and his little brother, Max, together with Stella, um, uh, Julian's uh, fiance. Um, they've been well after their father, of course, and this is a human, a human indignity as well as other, other things. So uh, just bear in mind that no one sees these photos. Uh, no one hears a word about Julian Assange, but this is a, a real problem. Now, um, I'm Irish, and uh, if, you look, if you look at Gabriel real close, you'll see that he's the spit of his father, <laughs> the spitting image of his father. May we have the next slide, please? Now, I'd like to get into a little substance, and I won't talk very long. I have a bunch of slides, and that, that tends to restrain my, my Irish uh, uh, tendency to, to keep talking. Um, Mickey Mad is a term that, that I coined uh, when I realized that the MIC, the military industrial complex, which President Eisenhower so presciently warned against, was outdated. It's no longer the military industrial complex, it's the military industrial congressional intelligence media academia think tank complex. Now, why do I say media? 
because media is right in the middle there. You can see it circled in red and that's by design. Without the media, nothing can happen the way the, Mick, the Mickey Man wants it to, to, to happen. You know, one thing to remember is that when Eisenhower, was it 60 years ago now? Yeah, 60 years ago, warned about the military industrial complex, he said two things. He said, you know, um, this could be uh, unsought for uh, predominance. Well, we know that's changed. <laughs> we know that the Mickey Mad is seeking all the money they can make out of arms sales and so forth. And he also said the only thing that prevent uh, the Mick or the Mickey Mat now to prevail would be a awakened, a conscience driven citizenry, a citizenry that is fully informed. That's what we don't have now. We don't have a citizenry that's fully informed. That's why the media controlled by corporate media uh, plays such a key role right at the fulcrum there. Uh, may I have the next slide, please? Okay, now, most of you remember, uh, well, some of you remember, I would say, back in the 70s, uh, a lot of uh, skullduggery was exposed to the CIA paying editors, paying writers, paying this and that to get the propaganda uh, up, up and running. Um, I, uh, that happened early on. Now, when Ronald Reagan came in, he picked Bill Casey uh, to be his director of central intelligence. And um, Casey was a, a real interesting fellow. At the first cabinet meeting, so this would have been early February, uh, 1981, okay? Casey saw fit to say this. Now, where do I get this? I get this from a good friend who was there. Did she share it contemporaneously? Yes, she did. This is what Casey said. We'll know when our disinformation program is complete, when everything the American public believes is false. Oh, February, 1981. Hmm, they've done a pretty good job uh, about that. Uh, let's have the next slide, please. Whoa, now this is a fellow named Ken Delanian. Uh, used to write for the Los Angeles Times. And uh, thank God for a FOIA, a Freedom of Information Act uh, request. They found out that Ken Delanian was uh, corresponding with the CIA, asking a permission or asking comments. Is it okay? Tell me if you want to push back on any of this. He says, uh, is, this article is not running this weekend. Uh, we could talk on Monday if you like. Uh, hello? <laughs> I mean, we know this is happening. We know that the New York Times, the Washington Post and Wall Street Journal all have their sources, all have their leakers, most of them quite official in the media. But here you have an email from Ken Delanian explaining to his uh, CIA friends, look, I have done this thing. If, if you want to push back, let me know. I'm not going to run till Monday. Give me a break, all right? Now, this next uh, photo might shock you a little bit, but it shouldn't. Uh, next photo, the next slide, please. Whoa, there's Ken Delanian. <laughs> and who's that next to him? Oh, John Brennan. Now, we all know that John Brennan and James Clapper and many other former intelligence operatives, leaders, uh, have cushy posts on CNN and MSNBC. So, so, so they don't really disguise their, their participation in forming our opinions and creating an informed citizenry like uh, Eisenhower said was necessary. But here we have at Fordham Law School, of all places, John Brennan and Ken Delanian. This is just a year ago. They are kind of, here it's Ken's probably thinking, what's he thinking? Uh, like, should I take this down or? You know, <laughs> so here's, here's Ken and here's John, his patron. Uh, they cooperated in making sure that nothing got into the LA Times at the time uh, without John Brennan's as people massaging it, you know? Now, did Fordham Law School not know this? 
I hope they didn't. But isn't that a sad commentary on the naivete that lets a fellow like John Brennan, who played a major role in torture, extradition, everything else, uh, let him be here on the stage with, with, with his uh, uh, compatriot correspondent. And, uh, you know, I guess I should admit up front, I'm a Fordham alumnus, okay? It pains me greatly that, that uh, Bill Casey and John Brennan also are Fordham alumni, the more so since, uh, oh, the president of Fordham about eight years ago took it into his head to let John Brennan give the commencement address and give him, I get this, a honorary doctorate in humane letters. Uh, some, some students protested, but they were told uh, by the president of Fordham University, you know, torture is a gray area. It's a gray area. Now, a friend of mine, former Jesuit who worked in Salvador, uh, talked about the, the celebrity virus, okay? Uh, universities like to have celebrities, and it doesn't matter if they're celebrities because they tortured or, or because they uh, prostituted the uh, media profession, uh, they're celebrities. And, you know, Fordham's not the only, only, only uh, university, Boston College, up where you all live, okay? Who did they have give the <laughs> commencement address for the law school 10 years ago? Condoleezza Rice. And she was the one that ran the, the, uh, the torture sessions in the bottom of the White House, which even Attorney General Ashcroft said, should we really be doing this in the, in the White House? You know? So, you know, the celebrity virus is real, really vile and it's predominant. And I would stress that when we talk about the Mickey Mat, a lot of people don't you know, say, well, well, no, we understand military, industrial, congressional intelligence, media, but academia, come on, academia and think tank, you're going too far, McGovern. Let's have the next slide. Oh, now, Michael McFall heads up a very prestigious institute out at Stanford, okay? Now, he was one of the drivers behind the totally discredited Russiagate narrative now. Uh, and, uh, you know, he's been, he's been buffeted about by people who know the real story, uh, people who don't rely solely on the New York Times. And he's, he's been, become very defensive. And, you know, asked one, you know, why he, why he fell in with all his expertise. He was ambassador to Russia, for God's sake why he fell in with this Russiagate stuff, uh, this is what he said. I have a job for the rest of, uh, a job for life at the best university in the world. I live in a giant house in paradise. It's pretty nice out there at Stanford. I make close to a million dollars a year. I have adoring fans on TV and a half million followers on Twitter. 99% who also admire me. Mickey Matt, academia, think tank. Next slide, please. Now let's get back to Julian Assange. What makes him different? Well, you know, his father, John Shipton, was asked this question about two years ago and, and I, I copied it down and, and I put it on this slide here. Uh, he was asked about Julian's courage and a sense of justice. Where'd he get that? And his father, his father replied, Julian has always been very, very firm on injustice. Most children, of course, despise injustice, but we lose our sense of injustice as we grow older. But with Julian, he hasn't lost it. And he would still prefer, he would still suffer himself. He would still suffer himself before allowing another to suffer cruelty. Next slide, please.
Now, courage is a, a kind of, well, it, Thomas Aquinas used to say it was the, it was the basis for all virtue. All other virtue is specious if you don't have guts. <laughs> That's a free translation from the Summa, okay? And I love uh, Ben Ferenc. Uh, he just died last year, I believe. But, you know, he pointed out the, there are three things, uh, three things that are necessary. And that is uh, never give up, never give up. And finally, never give up. Okay. Now, courage. I'll tell you a little vignette. When I was a freshman at Fordham, uh, I had a basketball scholarship, but I was also enrolled, enrolled in all these fancy liberal arts courses, one of which was taught by a fellow named Tim Healy, uh, a Jesuit, and I had to write poetry in Latin, okay? <laughs> and so I asked to see him after, uh, after a couple of months, and, and he said, I right, come over on Saturday. So I came Saturday, 7.30 in the morning, he's shaving. And he said, oh, so Ray, what can I do for you? He's a great big guy, okay? Really neat guy, a Rhodes Scholar. Okay. So I said, well, uh, Father Healy, uh, you know, there's so much homework. You especially are pouring on me. I, I, I you know, I, I'm, getting, uh, I'm getting discouraged. He turned on me, and I thought he was going to bash me. I said, what'd you say? And then I got mad, and I, I said, well, I'm getting disgusted. I looked at me and said, oh, whew. I thought you said discouraged. Discouraged is not allowed. Disgusted, that's good. You're disgusted. All right, let's talk about it. Now, maybe you can learn from my, from my insight here that he was dead on. He was dead on. Discouraged is not allowed. Disgusted, yeah, that's good. That's sort of like... Uh, what Aquinas said about the virtue of anger. <laughs> I very seldom have a chance to quote from the Summa, but this is question 158. And he, he complained loudly, Aquinas did, that there was no word in Latin, the language in which he wrote, for the virtue of anger. <laughs> virtue of anger. He said, you know, there's a word for too much anger that was iracundia, and there was a word for being a milk toast, but there was no, nothing in the middle. You know, virtue is in the middle. Courage is just enough of what you need. Foolhardiness, no good. Cowardice, no good. Virtue is in the middle. So he went back to John Chrysostom of the early church. And what Chrysostom said, fourth century was, he or she who is not angry when there is cause to be angry, anger, sins, is unjust okay and then thomas put a little corollary on that he talked about um unreasoned patience he said unreasoned patience sows the seeds of vice nourishes negligence and encourages not only bad people but good people to do evil so i think what we need to do is heed what ben Ferenc says here uh not be discouraged what we need to do is, uh, you know, be virtuous and angry as hell at injustice. And that, of course, is what John Chipston, how he described his son, Julian Assange. May I have the next slide, please? Okay. Now, the question really is, um, you know, <laughs> I like to invoke uh, this Noah principle. I didn't make it up. I learned it a long time ago. It's really simple, okay? No more awards for predicting rain, awards only for making arcs, okay? So what's left to us? What's left to us is not to bitch and bitch and main and say we're discouraged. What's left to us is to build some arcs. And how do we do that? Well, I can tell you one thing, if I can remember the quote correctly, uh, what I try to do and what others, uh, my colleagues in veteran intelligence professionals for sanity and veterans for peace do, is try to spread some truth around. Martin Luther King Jr. had this to say, 
had this to say about boils, you know, boils, ugly things. He said, like a boil that can never be cured unless it is opened up with all this pus flowing ugliness to the, to the light of human conscience. So too injustice must be exposed with all the friction its exposure causes to the light of human conscience and, and national opinion before it can be cured. Uh, Martin also said, there is such a thing as too late. You know about that. There is such a thing as too late. Maybe I'll just finish with a little uh, true story about what happened at the end of the Nazi regime in Germany. The allies were coming close. Uh, there was a Gail Wolk, uh, a geologist, professor at the University of Berlin. His name was Albrecht Haushofer, okay? Now, like Dietrich Bonhoeffer, uh, Haushofer was getting a following behind him. He was becoming a danger to the Nazi regime. He was having a conscience. How did he get to have a PhD and tenure? Well, he had that because he, he minded his own business and he didn't speak out. Finally, he did speak out and gathered this retinue, this following behind him. Now, he was wrapped up finally and taken to a different prison from the one that Bonhoeffer was in. And uh, they said to him, now look, uh, uh, we have to have a confession from you uh, before we shoot you. It, it, that, <laughs> in that prison, they shot people. Uh, Haushofer was hanged, okay? So uh, uh, Haushofer said, no, Bonhoeffer was hanged. Haushofer said, that's for the birds. I'm not gonna give you a confession. So as the allies came really close, uh, they took them out and they shot them. As they picked them up, uh, there was a little settle, a little piece of paper came out of his pocket. It was his confession. It was written in the form of a sonnet. Schuld, those of you who know German, guilt. Doch bin ich schuldig, aber anders als ihr denkt. Uh, yeah, I'm guilty, but it's not what you're thinking. Ich musste früher meine Pflicht erkennen. Ich musste schärfer Unheil, Unheil nennen. I should have more quickly recognized my duty. I should have much more sharply criticized evil as evil. Mein Urteil habe ich zu lang gelenkt. I put off my judgment far too long. Ich habe gewarnt, I did warn, aber nicht genug und klar. Okay, klar, claro, klar, clear. Genug is enough. So I did warn, aber nicht genug und klar. Und heute weiß ich, was ich schuldig war. And today I re recognize what I was guilty of. So what am I saying here? I'm saying here that we need to not complain and not predict rain. We need to build some arcs. How we build those arcs? Well, the only thing I can say from my own experience is the first step is to get some people around you, just a handful, four, five, six, seven's too many, three is too, too little. Get people who think the way you do about justice and about truth and get together every, every week. And you will be amazed at what comes out of that kind of synergy. Uh, you will find yourself supporting one another, whether it's together or whether you go off on your own. Uh, this, these small groups is where it begins. And if you don't have a small group, well, you, you're not really, you're, you're at a disadvantage. So I can't really uh, explain or to, or you know, trying to predict what, what things would be best for you all up there in Massachusetts. But I can say this, that, uh, you know, it's a perfect storm. Uh, we're gonna have really bad stuff coming out of Afghanistan. We're gonna have really bad stuff continue to come out uh, about COVID. And, you know, we have the quintessential threat, uh, the existential threat, I should say, of climate change. Now, I don't know about you all, but I have 10 grandchildren. 
am I going to sit around and say, well, you know, <laughs> I don't give a rat's patootie. <laughs> I'm going to be gone by the time there's no clean water or clean air. No, I got to get out there and do something. And so if you need, need causes, well, they're there, right there. And um, I won't presume to, uh, to suggest uh, precisely what you might do. All I know is that we have to do something and that we can't pretend that there are not enough of us. Last thing I'll say is, uh, you know, Cesar Chavez, when he wanted to do something, he complained later. He said, you know, there were always people saying, oh, I would love to do that, but there's, there's not enough of us. Not, there's not enough of us. And he said, there is enough of us, okay? There is enough of us, but if we sit around talking about there's not enough of us or predicting rain, nothing gonna happen. Without action, without peace action, nothing's going to happen, okay? And, um, you know, si, si puede. We can do it. Si, si puede. Thank you for listening. <laughs>